Luke, who gives us the gospel according to Luke, never forgot the day that Jesus had a long discussion with the Pharisees. My, my guess is that most discussions between Jesus and the Pharisees tended to be rather short. But there was that one time when Jesus started telling some parables and they stuck around. We hear about that in uh, Luke 15. We started looking at it last week. Jesus was eating with the tax collectors and the Pharisees are grumbling. That's not what a good rabbi should do. Grumble. You know how that grumbling goes, right? And Jesus responds by telling them this parable has a bit of an edge to it about this the shepherd seeking for lost sheep. And the edge is like parable, uh, Pharisees, why aren't you out looking for lost sheep? The Pharisees keep on listening. At the end of this parable, they don't storm off. So Jesus tells another. He says, you know, it's a uh, kingdom of God's like a woman who loses a coin. It's one of only ten coins she has, so she looks for it real hard. How, what, what, what would be one-tenth of your net worth? If you took everything you had in the bank, what would one-tenth of it be? Right? If you lost that, how hard would you look? All right? So she's looking for one-tenth of her net worth. And after she finds it, she rejoices. And again, the Pharisees are, are, are listening. Right? Why aren't you rejoicing when uh, the, those who are lost are found? The Pharisees are listening, but and they, don't, they don't leave. So Jesus tells another parable. And this is the parable we read a minute ago, the parable of the father and his two sons. The younger son makes this horrible decision. He tells his dad he wants his inheritance. And what does it take to get your inheritance? Right? Your dad's got to die. And so what he's telling to him is, Dad, you are dead to me. Right? I want my money. And so he, he, he takes the, the farm, the father takes the farm, and he, gets it, he gives the younger his third of the farm. And... Uh, and the younger son leaves. Right? And what does it take? Can, can, you can, land doesn't pack very well, does it? If you want to take the family farm and go somewhere, what do you got to do? You got to sell it. So he has sold a third of the family land, and he has left. And he goes, he goes to another country, and he burns the money. He squanders it. And uh, he gets down so low that he is eyeballing the food that pigs are eating, and it looks good. And he comes to himself, he has this moment when he realizes how far he has fallen, and what, how stupid he has been. And he starts heading back, thinking, I can be my dad's servant, and at least I'd eat well. His father sees him, rushes to him, discarding all dignity, embraces him, brings him home, kills the fatted calf, and there is joy and celebration. And we would love to end the story right there. That's the hallmark ending right now. Credits roll, everyone's happy. Except it's not, because there's the elder son. The story points out some details that are just fascinating. It says the elder son is standing on the threshold, right? He's right on, it's like a, someone standing right outside on the front porch. They're not going to go inside while well, that person's in the house, right? And, and the father and the elder son are arguing. And you ever play that game? Like, I'll, I'll tell Olivia, Olivia, your daughter's acting up, right? And, and, and you catch the, the, the word play there. That can get mighty serious because the, this elder son says to his dad, your son is here, and he has besmirched the family name. And the father is saying, your brother is here. And this elder son is saying, no, no, your son. All right? Not my brother. Your son has besmirched the family name. He has sold the farm. He has just made a mess of this whole thing. How can we celebrate this? All right? We're left at the end of this parable with this uncertain resolution. Will the elder son be able to get over himself and find joy at the one who is lost coming home? That's a story with some meat to it. Right? You start talking about lost uh, sheep. You know, that, that's kind of abstract. Lost coins, you know, that's important. It matters. But uh, anyone can rejoice over a lost sheep or a lost coin. You know, if you find a $10 bill in your pocket when you've done the wash, you don't get angry at the 10 for having left, do you? You're just happy you found it. But when you start talking about people, right? People have histories. There are stories there. This parable has, has some weight to it. Now the, the, what has been lost is a person who has done something. Then we get to the end. Of, that's the end of chapter 15. Now, chapters in the Bible, the heading, chapters get in the way sometimes. And this is one of those because we, we tend to think, that's it, right? Jesus has chatted with the Pharisees. We now move on to the next chapter. But if you look where the Pharisees show up again, they're still listening when you get to chapter 16, 16 verse 14. The Pharisees are still listening. So 
Jesus is still talking, and they're still sitting there listening. Luke, is, Luke 15 does not start three, Pharisee, three parables that the Pharisees listen to. There's four, right? And so the fourth parable, and they're building, right? So the, the, there's the sheep, there's the coins, there's the lost son, and now there's one more parable, and it continues to build. It continues to, to develop. Jesus, they're still listening, so Jesus keeps on telling them. And so now he's going to tell them this, the hardest of the parables. He tells them the parable of the steward. And we don't, we're not even sure what to call this parable, because if you open your Bible, some, bear, some uh, Bibles are going to call it, in the headings, the parable of the, of the shrewd steward. Like he's a little bit too good with money for his own good. He's shrewd, but you know, he's not exactly criminal. And some will call this the, the parable of the dishonest steward. Ugh, liar, right? That, that's a whole different connotation. We, we don't know what to make of this. So Jesus tells this, this parable of the steward. Now, a steward is the one who has been entrusted with the care of a person's property. In this situation, it's a rich man. And the steward, it's like giving someone power of attorney. Right? You can sign anything you do. It's like the person who you have power of attorney. It's like they did it. And so that's what this is happening here. The steward has power of attorney, and he is doing business for his master. And uh, it is found out that he has been untrustworthy. The parable strongly implies that what's happening here is he has been skimming money off the top. When he makes a bargain, his master gets some of it, but he also keeps some as well. The person whose property he has been managing realizes this, and he, he calls the steward in the office and tells him, this ain't going to fly. You're done here. And the steward has this moment of crisis. He has this realization. He can't dig. Not, he's not young, right? Too proud to beg. And so he's got to do something. So he does. He goes to the people that he has been doing business with on behalf of his master. That he's been overcharging and keeping the extra for himself. And he gets square with them, right? He squares up. He's been overcharging. And now he tells them, okay, this is actually what... You, you owe me 100, make it 50. Right? You, you, you owe me 100, make it, make it 80. Right? And, and what do we see by the fact that he is, he's knocking this off the top? What does that tell us? First, he hasn't been skimming just a little. This is not like he's just skimming 5%. Right? If he's knocking people's bills down from 100 barrels of oil to 50, he's been skimming a lot. Right? He's been a bit greedy. No wonder he got found out. Right? Two, we find out he's good at covering himself. Because who actually writes it down? Does he write it down to the change? No, he has the people who are doing the business. He has them write it down. So there's no paper trail that he got, he got involved. He is pretty uh, canny there, isn't he? Three, we find out he is finally getting square. He's finally doing right by these folks. Yes, he is doing it under duress. Yes, he's doing it for his own sake because he's afraid if he gets out there by himself, he, he won't, he'll be the untrustworthy person. Well, he's got to do what he can to at least say, you know what, I, in the end I squared up, I, I got this right, so you can trust me again in the future. Right? He's trying to build some goodwill. And in the end, the, the rich man whose stuff he is, uh, property he is managing praises him. That's kind of a humdinger of a parable, isn't it? Kind of makes you squirm. Not sure what to make of it. The funny thing about it is if you look at it and think about how it unfolds, it, it fits the pattern, right? We, we've gone from sheep to coin to the, the prodigal son, and, and now we develop it one more step, and it's the same story as the prodigal son. You have a, a, a protagonist that you're not exactly wanting to cheer for, the younger son and the steward, all right. who faces a crisis due to their own stupidity. Hey, Dad, I want the farm. I think I should start cheating my master. And the protagonist's entire world descends into chaos. I'm eating with pigs. I might not have a job, and I'm going to be destitute and homeless. And the protagonist, scared, chastens, finally makes a good decision, turns, so does something right, right. I should go home. Maybe I should charge people what I should have been charging all along. And then, having turned a new leaf, the story is resolved, right? And the, the son, younger son goes home, the, the steward goes back to his master, and, and they are both praised. It's the same story. It's just pushing a bit 
further. The fourth story is pushing because, you know, sheep and coins, you look for what's lost, you don't blame them for being lost. The prodigal son, you know, the prodigal son is such a it's, a, it's almost mythic, it's almost like Disney, it's so like cut and dry, there's three characters, there's the good son, there's the, or the good father, there's the bad son, and then there's the son who needs to get over himself. It's very simple, right? It's nice, it's easy to cheer for, but it's not real life, is it? The steward, that's real life. Right? That, that actually gets into it. Right? And, and so if, if, the, if they're the same story, they all, they all, both of them have three characters. Right? There's the father, who has joy if the son returns. There's the, the younger son, who does something stupid. And then there's the elder son, who responds. Right? In the story of the steward, there are still three characters. There's the, the, the rich man whose property is being managed. There's the steward who does something stupid. Who's the third character? Who's the one who is struggling to make what to, what to make of that steward? It's you. Right? You are the ones. Because as you're listening to that steward, what do you about that steward, what are you thinking? I don't, I don't, I don't like him. I've never messed with anyone else's money. He was messing with other people's money. I don't like, no, I don't think we should welcome. You start grumbling about that steward, about how he's been kind of a, sl a slime ball, kind of a scuzz. You're not happy to see him, and who are you sounding like? The elder brother. Right? This is a parable that has a trap built into it. They, Jesus just keeps on preaching along, and the Pharisees just keep sitting there, and then the trap closes, and you've been caught. Because you're grumbling about the steward, just like the elder son was grumbling about his brother. And you realize, ooh, Jesus is smart, right? That's, the, that's what we're kind of building to with, with this, this set of, of parables. We're building to the moment when you can realize how hard it is to welcome someone, to have joy at seeing someone when you know something about them, Right? It's easy to welcome and be excited about a sheep or a lost coin or the prodigal son. You don't know any of his backstory. But when you know the steward, ugh, now you know some backstory. And it gives us a chance as we read this parable to do what a, a, a fortune cookie once told me. Got this at the Chinese place down in Macon. Dreams are extremely important. You can't do it unless you can imagine it. Right? You can't do it unless you can imagine it. If you can't see yourself doing it, you're not going to do it. And so this parable gives us this opportunity to imagine how we might respond to people who are lost when we know why. We know the backstory. We know what happened. Like the elder son knowing about the younger son, we understand the, the situation, right? Right? And if we, we see people that we know the history of, the story of, you know what usually happens if we're not, we haven't imagined how we might be, have some joy at seeing them? What, what do we do? We're Midwesterners. What do you do if you see someone that you don't want to see? Eye contact and a nod. Right? You ever walk down the aisle in Walmart and you hear a voice one aisle over and it's someone that you don't want to talk to? Right? And you have this moment where you have to figure out what you're going to do. And your options are threefold. You can rejoice like Jesus does. Rejoice that there is someone right one aisle over that you can show the love of God and you can smile. Or you can skip the aisle and pray that they don't look. Or three, you get your cell phone out and make sure to be on the phone so that if they do see you, you can do that Midwestern thing. Yeah, huh? Y'all ever done that? I am certain, absolutely certain of, I am certain of very few things. That when I have prayed that prayer, God, I just want to get out of here. Please don't let them see me. God is up there saying, nope. And there, that is a moment that they just turned, drawn, and then you make eye contact. And then there you are, the person you least want to talk to. And what are you going to do? You are... The elder brother seeing the younger son. You're the, the person in this parable. You're seeing the steward, right? If I have imagined myself ahead of time and thought about how do I greet people with joy, then I know what I'm going to do. 
Right? Can you ima imagine the person you least want to see at Richardson's or Walmart or wherever you end up doing most of your shopping? Imagine the people that you least want to see there. What would it be like to rejoice that you have seen them? Right? Even knowing right, the, 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 the situation there, how might you rejoice to see them? Who is the person you want to be in that situation? You hear the voice one aisle over. Do you want to be like the elder son who grumbles? Uh, or do you want to be like the father who discards social norms? I'm not saying run down the aisle in Walmart and give people bear hugs. That might not go over well. Security, aisle 15. Uh, <laughs> but how might you discard social norms and be pleasant and joyous and just happy to see people that you don't necessarily want to see? We're not going to have a chance to greet them here and show them joy here if we don't show them joy there at Walmart. Right? They'll never hear the good news of Jesus' love for them here if you don't love on them out there. And it begins when you can imagine yourself smiling at people in Walmart and being thankful you heard them one aisle over so you got 15 seconds notice. Because <laughs> we need that. We do. It is after this fourth parable that the Pharisees finally go away. I hope they pondered. I, Lord knows I am after reading this. I hope they realize what a trap they've just been caught in. Imagine what is the most warm and honest way you can greet people that rub you the wrong way, about whose past you know a bit too much. How might you practice joy at seeing others who you never expected to see? How might you be growing into being like the father who is excited and not the son, the elder son, who's a buzzkill. In doing so, we are the ambassadors of reconciliation that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 5. Signs of the peace of Christ. That when we talk about the peace of Christ, this is not something to be dismissed, but this is powerful, and it can change lives. And it can change lives right here, and it can change lives in the frozen foods aisle. Thanks be to God. Amen. Where'd my bulletin go? Huh. I can figure out what we're doing next. Please stand and join with me as we confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. <laughs>